It's Monday, March 6. In the headlines, the government proactively putting measures in place to combat a drought crisis. In business news, Grace Kennedy remains optimistic despite profit dip. Regionally, in Barbados, people with disabilities to have more access to services. Internationally, Turkish government pressed to find safe, temporary accommodations for millions of Turks displaced by earthquakes. And in sports, we're on the pitch. Cricket West Indies has announced the match schedule for the final three rounds of the West Indies Championship. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Cabinet will be keeping close tabs on the meteorological drought being experienced by Jamaicans. Prime Minister Andrew Holness has instructed that the Drought Management Committee meet weekly and provide Cabinet with updates in light of the current meteorological drought being experienced in Jamaica. There's more in this report from Maya Chung. Prime Minister Andrew Holness is reassuring Jamaican citizens as the country faces a serious drought issue that all is being done to ensure that the fallout is minimal. At a press conference at the office of the Prime Minister's Media Centre on Friday, March 3, the PM took time to share what his team are doing and will be doing to ensure that the people of Jamaica remain productive and safe during the drought. So we are in one of those low periods now of um, rainfall. Sometimes, of course, there are deviations, but generally, this is the, the pattern. Now, I just want to make um, some clarification. If you note, when I started, I said that Jamaica is in a meteorological drought. What that means is that the level of rainfall is so low that it is affecting the supply of water. And this is particularly the case for communities that are dependent on catchment, for example. So rural communities are likely to be um, greatly affected in a meteorological drought. But there is a more standard and precise definition of a meteorological drought, and that is determined by what is called the standardized precipitation index. And this is a tool used to monitor drought conditions based on precipitation, meaning rainfall. For Jamaica, a meteorological drought event occurs anytime the SPI, that is the standard precipitation index, is negative for at least two consecutive months and reaches certain particular values. And I won't go through what those values are, but suffice to say that we have hit those marks. So uh, the people who are in rural areas who depend on rainwater catchment or have water systems that depend on catchment, they are starting to feel the impact of the drought. So they don't need this index to say that they are in a, a drought situation. They can feel it. He explained further. The meteorological drought is different from the hydrological drought, which is focusing on your stream flows, your flows in your rivers, the level of water in your aquifers, and so forth. So um, we are not yet at that point. So we are not yet experiencing a hydrological drought. However, the starting point of that is when your rainfall is persistently low. So a, a hydrological drought, um, well, rather a meteorological drought could cause you to have, or will cause you to have, if it persists, a hydrological drought situation. So the situation is of concern, but it is not one in which I would say we should panic but we are being proactive, we are preparing the country, and uh, we are trying to bring our citizens into the understanding of the changes that are taking place in our climate and how it will impact 
your daily lives, and your social well-being. For the news on PBCJ, I am Maya Chung. Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, Colonel Charles Jr. says additional support is on the way for farmers affected by the ongoing drought. Minister Charles was one of several speakers at a press conference held at the office of the Prime Minister on Friday. Maya Chung reports. According to Minister Charles, the agricultural sector is particularly vulnerable to the impact of climate-based disasters, with severe weather conditions generally being a major challenge for the sector. This has resulted in estimated losses of approximately $196 billion between 2004 and 2017, leading to production losses in the agricultural sector. And that is why the government through the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries and our agencies is steadfast in advancing a strategic response to ensure that we can mitigate the fallout from the impact of the drought um, and any other negative consequence of climate change, particularly when we note that uh, the sector has contributed 7.3% to our GDP, where we have seen seven quarters of consecutive growth in the sector um, and where we know that we have continued our support to farmers of more than a billion dollars. So there's a lot for us to protect. Uh, that is why um, you would have heard our Prime Minister speak about the meteorological and the hydrological drought. For us, our concern is the possibility of moving into an agricultural drought, where the focus for us is not just on the rainfall patterns but more so on the moisture content in our soil, the capacity for our crops to uh, complete their cycle of development. And so uh, for us, through RADA, NIC, AIC, and other agencies, uh, we have continued to build resilience in the sector with a focus on short, medium, and long-term um, alleviation. Uh, we have so far uh, presented to the tune of $90 million um, in terms of trucking and other forms of support. And now another $110 million um, is now being activated to provide support to our farmers across the country. Uh, through the NIC, we have seen canal and pipeline rehabilitation. We have seen the conversion of surface irrigation uh, to pressurized systems, the rehabilitation of wells, the extending of hours uh, where we are pumping water from those wells, the rotation of supply, trucking, um, the new irrigation systems that are being put in, and very importantly, we have done some water utilization training for our farmers. All of this is important for us to make sure that we are working together to build resilience um, and to expand and fast track our efforts uh, to efficiently utilize our water resources to improve the access to water, and importantly for us in agriculture, to improve irrigation and moisture conservation systems. Through RADA and through AIC and the ministry, uh, we have provided trucking to the tune of at least more than 20 million, and another portion will be coming. Um, of course, more will be needed, but we know that we can uh, count on Minister Samuda in that regard to give us more support. Um, in addition to trucking, we will be purchasing a 4,000 gallon truck uh, to support our fleet. We will be continuing uh, this support to farmers across the country. We have now 10 completed water harvesting ponds, catchment ponds, three more being constructed, and two more that will be provided through the support for our hills to oceans project. Uh, we are also going to be advancing uh, continuous support through provision of seeds uh, to assist farmers in being able to uh, support them throughout the production phases. Right now, we're looking on 50 acres of grass to supply an estimated 100 acres of farmland with support, and that should support more than 300 farmers. Um, in addition to that, we have provided $15.7 million so far in support to our livestock farmers, and that support is provided in terms of black tanks and irrigation equipment. Um, and another 15.7 has already been identified uh, to uh, continue support to our farmers. All of this is in our effort 
to make sure that we can maintain the positive trends in agriculture. Right now, uh, we are very concerned. We are listening to our farmers in St. Elizabeth and across the country. Um, and we have activated already our immediate response. But it is more important for us to know that a comprehensive, long-term response is in place. We are advancing the largest capital investment ever in the Ministry of Agriculture through our irrigation systems in Essex Valley and SPAD and Pedro Plains to come. $4.4 billion is expected to be used this year uh, to drive our irrigation projects towards completion. Um, and that is the way that we'll be going forward in terms of building resilience. As you heard our Prime Minister say, it is not ideal for us to look only to the short term, but we know that we have to do that now. So black tanks, irrigation systems, drip irrigation, um, catchment ponds, uh, trucking, that's being done. The Rural Agricultural Development Agency, RADA, has provided drought mitigation support to the livestock sector to the tune of some $8.97 million in broiler production support and approximately $6.73 million towards small ruminant support for farmers. The Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries has made significant headway in providing irrigation support to farmers through the Essex Valley Agricultural Development Project and the Southern Plains Agricultural Development Project, SPAD, which represents the largest investment made by the ministry to date. The Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries said he is aware of the impact of the agricultural sector and the critical role it plays in poverty alleviation, food security and securing livelihood in rural communities. For the news on PBCJ, I am Maya Chung. Delta Airlines has increased the number of weekly flights between Boston and Montego Bay. Delana Seawright, senior advisor and strategist in the Ministry of Tourism, describes it as a major development. He says Delta Airlines has increased the number of non-stop flights between Boston, Massachusetts and Montego Bay, Jamaica to four times per week. The news follows the start of the new non-stop flights per week by another American carrier frontier between American cities of Denver, Chicago, St. Louis and Montego Bay. In 2022, Jamaica closed out the year with 3.3 million visitors and earnings of U.S. $3.6 billion. According to Mr. Seawright, 2023 is shaping up to be another record year, with 382,000 stopover arrivals recorded for the first seven weeks. Time now for the business report with Danita Rodney. Despite a 15% dip in yearly profits, the Grace Kennedy Group remains optimistic as the company looks to reap greater results from its Vision 2030 plan and moves to become a global consumer group in the next few years. In a media briefing following the release of the company's audited financials last week, the group CEO, Don Webby, said the group was working to navigate the headwinds they have faced in the recent months and that the strategic approaches being taken to managing these challenges will produce positive results and improve stockholder value in 2023. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Friday, March 3, the US dollar sold for an average of $154.06. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $113.39, the pound sterling traded for $183.72, and the euro sold for $165.13. In GSC trading, the GSC index advanced by 227 points, the junior market index advanced by 15 points, the combined market index advanced by 358 points, and the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 2,192 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 111 stocks of which 48 advanced, 43 declined and 20 traded firm. Stocks advanced for Berger Page Jamaica Limited, 
Cargo Handlers Limited and Caribbean Assurance Workers Limited. Stocks declined for 13A Student Living Jamaica Limited, 13A Student Living Jamaica Limited Variable Preference, and Barita Investments Limited. Trading firm were AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, Caribbean Cream Limited, and Community and Workers of Jamaica CCU Deferred Share. The overall volume leaders were Darimon Trading Company Limited with over 7 million units. Jamaica Borders Group and Dollar Financial Services Limited with over 1 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Calypso Micro Index Fund was the only active security posting a volume of 10 shares. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Cave Shepherd and Company Limited was the sole security trade in 1,000 shares. In regional business, after predicting that the country will continue to face difficulty in accessing foreign exchange, Trinidad and Tobago Central Bank Governor Alvin Hilaire has met with an economist to find solutions, one of which lies in not devaluing the dollar. Economist Dr. Valmiki Arjun says the high prices of oil and gas and hydrocarbon commodities at the end of 2022 would have helped the country earn good foreign exchange. And businesses in the manufacturing and food and beverage sectors have proven resilient, also earning foreign exchange from their high levels of exports. However, he says there is still an issue with importation which may offset this. Remember that they also use a great deal of foreign exchange and importing their raw materials and imp- importing the inputs, the, the machinery for the, the equipment, etc., that they utilize in the production process. So even though they are generating a great deal of foreign exchange, they're also utilizing a great deal of foreign exchange. But some of their, their difficulties in accessing foreign exchange have eased because of the, the 100 million US dollars that the um, Ministry of Finance provides to the Exim Bank. That has greatly assisted them. Dr. Arjun says, contrary to some commentators, the solution to the problem is definitely not a devaluation of the currency. He says because our balance of trade is so skewed to imports, this would not work for us. Much of the raw materials that goes into the production process, much of, much of the equipment that we utilize in the manufacturing sector, we don't manufacture it here and we don't have the capacity to manufacture these inputs to the production process here. We have to import it from abroad. Not just that, a lot of essentials that we utilize on a daily basis, the technology, the medication that many people have to take every single day. Because we do not have the capacity and the technical knowledge and even the financing to be able to make those products here in Trinidad to be. So we have no choice but to import it. He believes the solution is rarely increasing production. But the better thing to do is to increase our supply of foreign exchange earnings via increased production levels, not just in the energy sector, but more so out of the various non-energy sectors that we have, so we can ramp up their production levels and therefore ramp up the exports coming out of those sectors. This, Dr. Arjun says, will allow their resilience to bring improvement to their own production levels and increase their exports and foreign exchange earnings. Mary Therese Bernard for TTT News. In international business, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies plummeted one day after a crisis arose around Silvergate Capital, one of the most influential banks in the digital asset industry. Cryptocurrency prices plummeted on Friday, with Bitcoin dropping to its lowest level in more than two weeks. The plunge came a day after the emergence of another crypto crisis, this time involving Silvergate Capital, one of the most influential banks in the digital asset industry. Silvergate was dropped as the banking partner of several crypto companies, including heavyweights Coinbase Global and Galaxy Digital, after the lender's latest filing raised questions about its ability to stay in business. The move sunk Silvergate's shares Thursday to a record low of $5.72, down more than 97 percent from the stock's all-time high in November of 2021. The company's woes come in the wake of the implosion of crypto exchange FTX and sister company Alameda Research, both founded by one-time crypto wonderkind Sam Bankman-Fried, who is now facing criminal charges. Bitcoin on Friday plunged as much as 5 percent, while shares of Ether and crypto exchange Binance were also down. 
in market data for oil, oil prices fell after China set a lower than expected target for economic growth this year. Brent crude futures were trading down $1.07 at $84.76 and West Texas Intermediate crude futures were also down $0.99 cents at $78.69 per barrel. And that was the business report on PBCJ. I'm Denita Rodney. In regional news, Antiguan Prime Minister Gaston Brown has made a proposal which he says would significantly address the region's air transport woes. The head of government explains it would require commitment from other regional governments, something they have not yet shown. Garfield Burford reports. The issue of regional air transportation has been a thorny one for years. What had been chronic before is now acute. The government in St. John's has saved Liat from liquidation. It's now under administration with a leaner operation since its return. Prime Minister Honorable Gaston Brown has engaged with regional colleagues on the issue of regional transportation in two recent meetings, but he's far from pleased with the outcome. Now, clearly, there's no commitment coming from regional governments to support a regional airline that is publicly owned. I think the consensus is that we should rely on private assets and possibly um, with the Cal assets. I understand that they're investing some additional um, ATRs. Now here is the Prime Minister's proposal to improve the air transport service available in the region. I'm of the view that the OECS sub-region in Barbados should have a public sector entity to form the core of regional transportation and that that airline whatever it is called, could be supplemented by the private carriers. But I suspect that many of the leaders within the region do not wish to engage in the ownership of um, an airline because it is capital intensive, intensive, requires a significant amount of resources. He fears the regional integration project could be seriously undermined if this issue is not addressed. If we are really truly interested in preserving our integration movement and to ensure effective connectivity for our people. We have to understand that integration comes at some costs, including the cost to connect our people, to ensure the movement of people, movement of goods. And that in itself requires reliable transportation. Guyana's Vice President, Dr. Bharat Jagdeo, on Friday announced that India or other bilateral partners interested in searching for and producing offshore oil may be able to do so at the portion of the prolific Starbrook block that will be reclaimed from the ExxonMobil-led consortium. We decided at this stage we are not going to establish a national oil company and we went out to auction for 14 areas. There are several areas remaining offshore that were not auctioned or not part of the current auction. Those areas will be available for bilateral engagements. We then have sometime next year the relinquishment of 20% of the, the Starbrook block. And those areas would be available also for bilateral and possibly if, we, if the bilateral agreements don't yield the results that we hope they would yield, they would also be available for auction. So we have made no definitive, no definitive decision on the 20% being relinquished, that those would be all available for bilateral engagements or auction, although they're potentially available for the discussions at the bilateral level. And that is what we spoke of in India. And we have also indicated that to several other governments that are interested in participating at a bilateral level with us because we believe that some bilateral engagements could complement the more commercial type engagements with the private sector that we're 
getting through the auctions. People with disabilities in Barbados will soon have more access to services offered by the National Disabilities Unit, the NDU. This revelation came from the rector of the NDU, John Hollingsworth. We know that there are a lot of bead whackers and other small engine um, tools over there, blowers, lawnmowers, etc. If we can get persons involved with this particular skill, then we would be able to engage them in some income generating activity. In addition to that, we have an agricultural project that we hope to enter into with the Barbados Workers Union at Marco St. Philip, where we will train persons who are intellectually challenged in the field of agriculture, namely in the cultivation of food crops and also horticulture. What we hope to do in the coming period is also launch a massive sensitization campaign so that persons will see the need to treat persons with disabilities with dignity, provide opportunities for them and basically integrate them into the mainstream society. Uh, it is unfortunate that there are some of us who still think that persons with disabilities are less of a person, but that is a mindset that we hope to change through our initiatives, through the types of interventions with the public and through an intensive public relations campaign. The Caribbean Telecommunications Union and the United Nations Universal Postal Union have signed a memorandum of understanding to collaborate and promote digital transformation in postal services in the Caribbean region. The MOU was signed by Secretary General of the CTU, Rodney Taylor, and Director General of the UPU, Mashakiko Metoki. Both entities will collaborate to promote and carry out the deployment of the UPU's digital readiness for e-commerce assessment in the Caribbean. This in an attempt to assist in of the region's digital transformation plans. The aim is to provide seamless end-to-end e-commerce and e-government services throughout the Caribbean region. In international news, the Turkish government must move quickly to safeguard survivors of a series of earthquakes over the past few weeks in that country that have left millions at risk. This is what's called a cemetery of the unknown. It's one of the many where those who lost their lives in earthquakes in southern Turkey are buried. But their identities were never recorded. Like lots of others, Tubakara has been asked to give a DNA test and apply to authorities for any news of her husband. We still cannot get any news about him. We cannot reach him from anywhere. We looked at every place we were supposed to, even to the cemeteries. I don't know if someone took him to a hospital or maybe he lost his memory because we cannot find him anywhere. In the weeks after the quakes struck, many of the dead were buried without being identified. Now their relatives are trying to find them. Maryam Yildiz from Hatay is a mother of three. She saved two of her three children, but her seven-year-old son Chadash is still missing. I don't think he's dead. I've never felt he's dead. I believe my son will come back to me safe and sound. Maryam says she heard from witnesses that her son was pulled out from under debris alive. Some old lady told me a boy looking like my son was taken by some people, but she didn't know who they were. To find a missing person, family members give samples of their DNAs to the police and wait for them to check their records. Photos and DNA swaps taken from the dead have been recorded in sports, Cricket West Indies has announced the match schedule and venues for the final three rounds of the West Indies Championship. The region's first class four-day red ball tournament, which will be played in Trinidad and Guyana. Two rounds have been played so far and the tournament will resume on March 15 to 18 with Trinidad and Tobago Red Force hosting current West Indies Championship leaders Guyana Harpy Eagles at the Brian Lara Cricket Academy. The other two matches in the third round will see Leeward Islands Hurricanes face Barbados Pride at Queen's Park Oval in Trinidad and the Jamaica Scorpions facing Windward Islands Volcanoes at the Guyana National Stadium. The fourth round will be played from March 22 to March 25 with the fifth and final round from March 29 to April 1. And that's the news on PBCJ. I am Simone Absalom Gale. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. Thanks so much for watching.